Good morning. Those of you still out there in the hallway, come on in, grab a seat. We've got plenty of seats. We're about ready to kick off our second general plenary session. It's going to really follow on from some of the topics we discussed yesterday, so I think you're going to find a good flow to it. So come on in, grab a seat. Hope you all had a good evening last night, you had a little free time, go out and do what you want, sample a little bit of Atlanta, so I hope you're all refreshed and, and ready to go this morning. You know, I mentioned yesterday that uh, I had the opportunity to work for Jack Dempsey when, when I was in the Navy. Uh, some of you may or may not know that I also had the, the privilege to work for Mike Johnson uh, during my Navy career. Uh, Mike and I led a CB battalion together and that, that battalion, when I think back on it, reminds me a lot of, of APA as an organization because it's full of dedicated, very talented and capable people and both of them had a true can-do spirit and uh, I think the CBs are known for their can-do attitude, but I'll tell you APA is also known for its can-do attitude. So. Uh, I feel right at home here. But you know, Mike uh, also gave me a little bit of advice. Actually, he taught me an awful lot over the years, but uh, there's a little bit of advice that uh, I remember him sharing with me, and he said, when you have the microphone, you have power. <laughs> but you need to wield that power intelligently, and uh, responsibly, and never, never let anyone else put words in your mouth. All right. Now we're going to talk about what I want to talk about. No, seriously, uh, the pursuit of excellence and recognizing our very best is what APA is all about. Whether it's our people, our best practices, or the work of our most accomplished educational institutions, it is APA that sets the benchmark for excellence and leadership in our profession. It is the reason why I always encourage our members to pursue their professional development and leadership training through APA. Take, for instance, the APA Institute and Leadership Academy programs. Both programs are a must for any institution that is serious about professional development for its management team. Beginning this fall, and I mentioned this uh, during breakfast, APA will co-locate both programs twice a year as part of a new APA program venue called APA U. This change will greatly expand the quality network experience that attendees have come to expect at both the Academy and Institute program. Be sure to mark your calendars for the first APU offering. It's going to be September 18th through the 22nd at the Marriott Harbor Resort in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Registration for both the Institute and Leadership Academy is now available through the APA website, so I encourage you to go and sign up yourself or sign up your people. You know, here's the reality, and, and Polly gave me a little credit, but it's, a, uh, it's an easy concept to understand, really, that uh, we all understand the threat of deferred maintenance to our buildings, and we've developed strategies to combat that threat. We understand that if we neglect our buildings over time, they're going to deteriorate, fall apart, and uh, fail to serve the mission that they were built to serve. The very same thing is true with our people. If we fail to invest in the professional development of our people, they are going to wither and die just like our buildings. They are going to fail to perform the mission that they need to perform. And during these times of budget cuts and, and tight money, it's, it's all so easy to cut training, cut travel, um, and that's the very first thing you gotta cling on to, because that's where the success for tomorrow really exists. 
So I hope you're, you're all here. You understand that, but you need to convey that message uh, to your coworkers, your bosses when you go home. So I encourage you to do that. Also want to mention that the, uh, the Apple Bookstore located just outside this general session is going to be offering a 10% discount on publications purchased here during the conference. And you can also put in an advance order for APA's new Operational Guidelines Trilogy Series, which will be published this fall. And the new Trilogy Series is an update to the APA Staffing Guidelines publications. And the new series is really a must-have resource, and I encourage you to purchase it here and, uh, and have it the moment it comes out. Also want to put in a plug for a drive-in workshop that is scheduled in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, about one month from now, the middle of August, where we're going to be presenting the, uh, the drive-in, or we're going to be presenting the trilogy series at that workshop. And I think there are still seats available. So, but if you hurry, they're filling up fast. So uh, just another plug for that. Now at this time, I'd like to open this morning's general session, balancing tradition with innovation, is there room for both? During this session, our, pan our panel of presenters will examine the sustainability of the traditional education experience and how to strike a balance between old and new, a balance that meets the needs of students and the entire campus community. Please welcome today's session moderator, John Cook, the principal at the Sexton Group. John, it's all yours. Well, good morning. How's the conference going for you thus far? Good, 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 good. Well, it is our collective hope here to add to your conference experience in a positive way, and hopefully you'll walk out of here with some, uh, some ideas, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to contribute to our, our conversation as well. If you uh, read your, your bulletin, you'll see that there are uh, three people that are mentioned on this panel, and if you were here early, you might have seen a fourth chair being hastily added to the stage, and that's because we've added Steve. We asked Steve, who graciously accepted to uh, join us for the Q&A, session that will we'll follow. Uh, he has no prepared comments, but, uh, but we, we, we uh, are glad that he's able to join us. I asked him how I, he wanted me to introduce him in terms of his qualifications. He said he was introduced yesterday, and he really hasn't had anything, added any qualifications to that <laughs> in the last 24 hours. <laughs> so, but we're, we're glad to have Steve here. So uh, if I were to, to start this conversation about tradition and innovation in a traditional fashion, I might have looked up uh, in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary or so uh, the words tradition or innovation. And I thought, well, now let's be a little bit more innovative than that. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll use Wikipedia. You know, there's a, a respected source among academic scholars, right? And I thought, you know what? I have never trusted Wikipedia ever since I found this entry for Classroom. And if you read that, what you'll see is that in classrooms, what takes place is either teaching or learning, but apparently not both. So. <laughs> Hopefully your classrooms, in your classroom spaces, your learning spaces, teaching and learning are not mutually exclusive. And certainly on your campuses, tradition and innovation are not mutually exclusive either. It's not an either or situation. It's, a, it's an and both uh, situation. So I'd like to start out and asking by a show of hands in just a moment, how you would describe the balance between tradition and innovation on your campus. So take a read through those five options if you would. And in just a minute, we'll take a show of hands as to how, with a very broad brush, you would describe that balance on your campus for the things that matter to you, the things that impact you on your, on your daily job. So how many are the, represented that first bullet, that, that your campus is seriously out of balance towards tradition? Let's see a show of hands. One strong one in the back and, and a couple of maybes, OK? How about that second bullet, that you're slightly out of balance? towards tradition. Ah, got a bunch of hands there. Great. How about seriously out of balance towards innovation? Wait a minute, same hand in the back. <laughs> what school are you representing back there, sir? I see, okay. Okay. How about slightly out of balance towards innovation, away from tradition? Interesting. And how about the last one? 
We get it just about right. Ah, some brave hands there too. Interesting. So we've got a nice mix here, gentlemen, of, of campuses to, uh, uh, to be thinking about. Well, let's look at tradition for just a moment. And I think when you, when you consider the balance between tradition and innovation, it's easy to paint tradition negatively and paint innovation positively. Now, from the opening session yesterday to a number of the sessions to about any jur journal rag that you, that you pick up, there's a focus on innovation. Do more with less. Fulfill the campus mission. Do it faster, cheaper, uh, more efficiently. Improve student outcomes, learning outcomes. Right? Respond to the criticisms that have come so vehemently against higher ed recently. So you, you know the drill. And yet, tradition deserves a spot at the adult table during that conversation. Right? It's often what brings us the joy, the richness, the texture, the personality, the distinctiveness of our campus. And I imagine some of your happiest moments on your campus, uh, particularly as a student, were related to tradition. Sometimes the traditions are a little bit of that fat on the edge of that steak that just adds so much flavor that shouldn't be eliminated. It reminds us that we're on campus for a short period of time as students, and not to waste that time, but to make the most of it. And finally, it reminds us that we're part of something larger than ourselves and longer lasting. And I think we all need to hear that, particularly a fresh out of high school 18-year-old freshman. So what are some of your favorite memories of a tradition on campus? You know, when I started at Purdue University as a freshman in 1980, I was told that one of the student traditions was called the Nude Olympics. And this was a, a, a long-time tradition that was an endurance running race that happened at midnight on the coldest day of the year. And basically, you were, uh, uh, the outfit was a ski hat and tennis shoes, and that was it. Uh, I'm mighty glad that there was no cit citizen journalism or Facebook at that point, <laughs> uh, frankly. Um, and given the legal environment, I can understand why it was, a, it was eventually um, uh, frowned on by the, by the administration and, and finally put a stop to. Uh, but it bothered me that uh, uh, that that was gone from my, from my campus experience. Is anybody here from Purdue by chance? Great. How many times did you guys run? <laughs> oh, th 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 three and four. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so all campuses have a number of traditions. Uh, some of them we're more proud of than, <laughs> than others. Um, Don will come speak uh, later about traditions that don't involve misdemeanors on his campus and, and some of the positive things at, uh, at, at University of Virginia. <clears throat> so, oh, and I'd forgotten this. I just noticed this yesterday, actually. I just pulled this up, that there's actually a Facebook page for the Purdue Nude Olympics, believe it or not. Something's been canceled for, uh, for 10 years or so. So now let's look at innovation for just a moment. And if you can't tell by this picture, this requires a little bit of study. <laughs> it's an old-time CRT monitor put on, put on a copier. <laughs> and who needs a printer? <laughs> so personally, I'm glad that technology is finally being used as student tools and as tools to improve student outcomes rather than tools to basically automate the lecture and make the lives of the faculty members easier to, to lecture. Um, so I think that's, that's some real innovation that, that's happening. And I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time on what the benefits of innovation are. As I say, I'm, I'm really glad that, that learning outcomes and student outcomes are, are uh, finally coming to the forefront there. Um, but all the tools to, to bring efficiency and productivity and safety and comfort and convenience and all of those things um, are, are all the benefits of, of innovation. And I think one of the most famous innovation projects over the past 10 years ago uh, was from Duke University. And if you remember way back in 2004, which just seems like a lifetime ago, when they, they got all that publicity for giving out iPods to the incoming freshmen. And that was just absolutely radical at the time. They were the first ones to do that in any serious fashion. And I remember speaking to somebody at Duke about 18 months later and asking them what the primary benefit was of that program. And they said it would change the culture. And it helped bring a culture of innovation to their campus and helped extend, actually, that, that culture of innovation to that campus. So even sometimes something fairly limited like that, I think the whole thing cost them a half a million dollars in the hardware. And then there's obviously support costs and such. Uh, but fairly limited and be able to change the culture of an entire campus and improve the, the, the culture of an entire campus. So with that as an introduction, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, David Marr.
David is the president of Blackboard Transact. He leads the Transact business that delivers enterprise commerce, security management, and notification platforms. He brings 20 years of a business experience working closely with academic and government entities to develop and implement customized business solutions enabled by leading technology. His career highlights include deploying the country's largest K through 12 data warehouse, leading Bering Port's multi-year modernization effort at the US Department of Education, and developing a CRM strategy called Student for Life. David served as a national speaker on numerous occasions on numerous topics related to the intersection of technology and education. We're happy to have him. Welcome David Moore, please. <laughs> Not that it's a rough crowd, but I just feel more comfortable without a suit on all the time. Thank you for inviting me. I am going to be running off my technology down here and because I have some videos. Uh, I'm not big on PowerPoint. I, I tend to find we get bludgeoned by PowerPoint a lot, just decks and words and words, and I'm a visual learner. Uh, I've been at Blackboard for five years and spent a tremendous amount of time on campus talking with uh, instructional designers on pedagogy, on understanding um, how we're rolling out our technology, but the most important thing is that I'm not here to say that Blackboard is driving anything. We are actually being pulled by your students. We are pulled on a daily basis, what we call the millennials, pulled on a daily basis. So every day I get up, I'm, I'm feeling I'm behind because the emails that come in, the conversations when we're on campus, uh, the, the presidents, the provosts, the CIOs are constantly telling us we're behind, we're behind, we're behind. And I'm not sure that that's probably too different from at times what you hear on campus, we're behind, we're behind, behind. I just have to write code. You all have to build buildings, physical structures. A lot more lead time. So um, I, I respect where you are and, and what you do and, and the lead time it takes to transform your campuses. And I do believe there's a perfect, I believe that tradition and technology coexist. I think one complements the other. And I believe that the richest part of education is really around tradition, community, interaction, that campus experience, that sense of belonging. So, and, and it goes when you drive anywhere. What do you see around people's license plates? They're alma mater. You had an effect. The campus has an effect. It's rich. It's meaningful. And that shouldn't be lost. And much of that effect is that campus environment, that community environment, and the buildings that support that engagement. Quickly, on Blackboard, a lot of people uh, see us as a, an LMS company. That is something we do. But I wanted to give you a sense of some other technologies that are on your campuses that you may or may not know that we're behind. So if you look at the screen, the learning system, the LMS, absolutely. Collaborate, co collaborate asynchronous learning. So this is when teachers are teaching or students are collaborating together and their, their pictures, like in Skype, are real time on the screen so you see all your classmates, they see you, and you can interact in that fashion. Blackboard Connect, a lot of campuses, emergency messaging, mass notification technology that's on campus. Analytics, taking all that rich data there and bringing it forward and allowing the institution to make decisions. A lot of those decisions and all that data goes also toward accreditation, which is very important for schools, and mining that data. Blackboard Transact, campus card, stored value card, security, door access, surveillance, video surveillance, all part of technologies that we deploy. And then most recently, which is the big pool by students, is mobile. They want everything we've built now put on a mobile device. So that is a spectrum of what Blackboard is doing in supporting institutions. Globally, 9,300 clients, touching 20 million users on a daily basis. So I want to also talk about students being vocal, because I'm sure you're aware of that. I'm sure when you're walking campus or you're standing you know, looking at a new building you stood up, or you're looking at a building that maybe has some deferred maintenance, and you're trying to figure out what the retrofit's going to be. Students are vocal. Right now, today, 
and it happens about every 20 years, you literally have three generations. You have three generations in the workplace, you have three generations at school. You have the boomers, you have the Xers, and you have the millennials. And the millennials, again, are highly vocal. And the boomers are phenomenal at process, right? I'm a, I, I'm a boomer, I hope I'm really good at process. Phenomenal at process. The generation Xers are classically known as very good at execution. And the millennials are very good at collaboration, multitasking, but also they want to be in the conversation. They want to be part of the decision-making process. So they may just have arrived at your institutions on your campus, and they want to contribute their opinion on how facilities should be architected or how common space should be defined. And it's the millennials, and have you ever heard the term helicopter parent? out there. So I mean, literally, it's a regular basis uh, when I'm talking with, with uh, faculty and I'm uh, provost, parents are coming in contesting students' grades for them. And, and that is, you know, for me, it takes me aback. I hope that, I, I promise you, I will never be contesting my children's grades. But that is happening out there, and that's the environment you're working in. And, and just so you know, those, those students on campus that their parents are contesting grades for, us boomers, we actually created those millennials. So there's some culpability here, and I'm not saying that this is a, I think this is a very seasoned audience. I'm not saying it's old, but I see a lot of boomers. So we created this. So when I look at that and I hear students coming at us, sending us emails, which I'm about to show you, I'm thinking, okay, we created this. This is, as a boomer, I created this. So we have an open mailbox sent to the CEO of the company. And students take a lot of care in sending emails to our CEO, Michael Chasen. So I'm going to flash this up there. Now, the student created an anonymous email tag and probably didn't use the best language, so I want to warn you before I put that up. But anyway, it's an anonymous email comes in. It's like, dear, dear Blackboard CEO, thank you. I, mu I must, but the subject, thanks for ruining college, right? Like, what? So we had this at an executive. We shared it with our board of directors. Thanks for posting this email website so I can send you an email. I feel I must tell you that your software and hardware are ruining the experience that students are supposed to have in college with your built-in plagiarism detection software. I feel as my teachers don't trust me anymore. Um, with all the tracking you've built into it, um, they can tell when I've read assignments, turned in assignments. And also, the campus technology, my parents no longer give me money, but they put it on my card and they dictate how and when it's spent. So basically, thanks for ruining college and taking the fun out of college. And I'm thinking, I mean, and also look, it's, it's, it's Blackboard 326. That means 325 Blackboard stinks were already taken. So we get a lot of these emails coming in. <laughs> and, and this is the millennial who wants, to, who wants us to have all this technology, but then again, how ironic, hates our technology because we're taking the fun out of college. So that's the world we're living in, and that's the world we're trying to support. Now, what's important is the demand that's being placed on us as a technology provider on mobile. And it does affect your designs. It affects how you create space. Because students today, they live in a mobile world. They socialize spontaneous groups. They learn in the social world. They learn in a sense of community. This is just how their DNA fires. So all we're doing is trying to catch up with their demands. So I'm going to show three videos which I think nicely frame what's going on on campuses around the world and, and, and on some of your campuses right now. And I will tell you it's not slowing down. So I'm hoping that you'll take these videos, get insight into the students and how they're thinking and processing information, and then how does that inform the design of your space? How does that inform new buildings and retrofits. Say it's the beginning of the term, and you're having second thoughts on advanced topics in submarine groundwater discharge. There's an app for that. 
and say you're considering enrolling in the iPhone programming class before that last spot gets taken. There's an app for that. And say you want to catch the next bus to the computer science building and see where the buses are in real time. Yep, there's an app for that too. Introducing the new iStanford. So th this is just the tip of the iceberg, and I remember, especially in drop ads, I mean, how many, by show of hands, used to stand in an auditorium or a stadium to fight for program cards to get a class, right? That's not acceptable to our millennials, right? They want to fire up their, their, their mobile phone and drop, and literally is what's happening, drop and add classes on the fly. In fact, they want a message when that spot has opened up. It's almost like eBay, and I think, you know, from a sense of an unrelated business income on campus, you could probably actually create some type of lottery point system where they're bidding for that last slot, because they're so used to doing that, as we do with eBay, when, it, when you get beat, your price get beat, it, what does it do? It sends you a message, hey, do you want to up your bid? This is what they're expecting. This next video gives you a sense of not only what they expect, but they talk about how they live and the importance of that. So window into their expectations. Our students are always connected, always on. 75% of our students have some kind of a smartphone. The number in two years time will be 100%. Everyone understands that a mobile strategy for a university has to involve handheld devices. So what Northwestern University has done with Mobile Central is we built the Northwestern University iPhone app, BlackBerry app, and a direct web mobile presence. When I first saw it, my reaction was, wow, we need to have this at Northwestern. It's a lot like the difference between having a computer and your mobile phone. I thought it was cool that our school had its own app. It spoke highly of Northwestern that they were trying to incorporate this technology. They recognize how good this is and how good apps are. When I was a freshman, the iPhone wasn't out yet. Now you look around and tons of people have iPhones and Blackberries. Students are coming here expecting a lot more from the university. When I first saw the application, it was very exciting because of the possibilities that would apply here in terms of viewing shuttle times, class schedule, or maps, uh, also athletics and different events going on at campus. If I'm ever sitting bored on a Friday night and I don't have to work, I'm like, oh, what can I do tonight? Let's check out the calendar. I was trying to figure out exactly when an event was happening on campus. There's a ton of stuff going on that I had no idea was going on. Coming on campus freshman year, having this app on your phone would be super helpful. I use the library one because it's a lot more convenient than turning on my computer. I've been looking for really specific stuff for my research. I've been able to find all the books I needed on the app. Having the information on the go, I think that's the key. It was the first day of my discussion section. I was running late and I didn't know what building it was in, but I used that map and it was really helpful in getting me to class slightly closer to on time. Sometimes, believe it or not, when I'm sitting here at my desk, I will actually turn, grab my iPhone, and use the directory app off the iPhone rather than use the one that's on my desktop. I think the development of it went very quickly because we were fortunate to have a good team from Blackboard. The two principals for Mobile Central, they're fresh from being students. This whole initiative is about bringing to students the information where and how they want to use it. Universities can be somewhat glacial from when we signed our contract to the point it showed up in the iPhone store. It was a period of nine and a half weeks, which was just an extraordinary turnaround for us. I think the important thing is really to build on what we've done. I'm excited about what the future holds. They'll be able to add and drop classes and buy tickets. Shuttle GPS applications. I feel like a lot of people don't realize how different and how amazing this stuff is. Everybody I know who has an iPhone does have the Northwestern app. If we're talking about reaching students, if we're talking about reaching younger alumni, then what we need to have is the wireless application. And we've got it. We can either participate in this or we'll be left behind. The part that is the challenge is to make sure that not only these technologies are interesting and fun, but they are also useful in our mission. The potential is tremendous. So in the the one of the takeaways I, I look at this is around the library. We, we Not only are students able to gather that data and deliver it right to the mobile device, but to, to the extent that documents aren't available in an electronic format. There are schools now where you're ordering books and they have a concierge service that delivers that book to the location 
where that student is. So again, the millennials are expecting that, and the importance there is they don't even want to go to the library. I, when, when I was in school, I lived in the library and enjoyed the library, but honestly didn't have a choice. You had to do, be there to do the research. So it's affecting their expectations, and they're coming on campus wired by the commercial world and what they expect. Final, final video, and this is also the rate of speed and change that's happening and, you, and thinking about how do you incorporate that in your space design. When Apple released its iPad, uh, the other thing is the picture of those young kids that are the developers for Blackboard Mobile, literally were still at Stanford. We bought their company when they were juniors. And, and all I asked, I said, just, you've got to finish your degree, please, you've got to finish. And they did. But when we look and say, wow, I'm old, right? I, I, we need to hire these students. We, we like them to graduate, but you have to hire because those are the barometer. That is what is happening there. So we hire continuously in undergraduate to keep that fresh, what they want, and make sure that we can keep up with the product. But relating to the iPad, that was released, let's say, two years ago. Technology happens so fast that we released this next application the day after the iPad was released. We took our whole learning management software and the next day had it delivered on the iPad. In fact, we, we, Apple asked us not to launch it the same day they launched the iPad because they wanted a bigger splash. So this is happening so rapidly. It's what we face every day when we get up, but this starts to change the world here. You're late to your morning final, but you have a few things left to study. Remember that discussion thread on dark matter? It's right there. Or that visualization of the double helix? It's there too. Announcements, discussion forums, all your homework assignments, even the name of that cute girl from class, it's all right there. And after all those hours of studying on the go, what you're looking for is right there. And what this proposes, and, and we're seeing, you know, as, as I went to school, you're, 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 you went to the library, and I'm looking for maybe something about Rome and the Forum. And I'm sitting there looking through books, right? Well, today, or you know, two years ago, I could potentially go to the LMS, right? I'd go on my LMS system, and I'd have maybe videos embedded, and I could take a virtual tour of the ruins. All right, what changes dramatically, especially with the release of the iPad 2 with the camera and video capability in it? You can actually be at the forum. So what we're starting to see with teachers, when they look at their pedagogy and how we explore and expand out there, you send students off campus, so the world becomes a global laboratory, and I can literally be at the forum taking a photo of that, and at the same time blogging with students in my class in the States, or tapping another application called Scholar, which links everyone in the world that also runs Blackboard who has an interest in that same discipline can join that conversation. So you start to get the sense of the expansiveness of the experience. But that's not to say that that makes the campus not relevant. The campus is highly relevant because that's the touchstone. That's the place where the students launch from and where they come back. So I don't believe, like some, that everything needs to go online. I actually think there's an important, um, and the data shows, there's important that high touch, that community, that engagement, and what's being on campus. But what we hear, from time to time is there are not enough spaces, although we have plenty of square foot, where we as students can aggregate on an impromptu basis and make sure that we have the technology that allows us the bandwidth, allows us to experiment, and allows us to collaborate in the way we expect. So these things are going on right now where, where biology professors are sending their students out into the field, collecting research data, collaborating real time, and coming back. So that's you know, out in the ether. We went out way out there and, and what millennials are demanding and where they're going back to campus. 
that does affect facilities, that does affect design. And the one thing that I, the two takeaways, getting more back to earth and down to earth, just so you know, it, it affects when you're building a facility or retrofitting a facility, a lot of times the last thing we think about is kind of the door and the door access. So there's two things. As students want your buildings open 24 hours so they can go where they want to go and, 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 and learn when they want to learn, it also poses a security challenge. Who should have access to that building? How do I attend that building? Now do I leverage technology and video surveillance to attend that building and I have a monitor and I'm looking at multiple labs or multiple. Also from sustainability. You know, we're smart, supposed to be cutting our carbon footprint, yet what is that, what's happening? The buildings have to be open 24-7 and we're burning away at it. Well, what's happening and what we're looking at right now in prototyping is the actual physical card that campus use, students use for security and access won't be fully going away, but it will be going to the phone. The one thing I think if I'm looking at facilities design in the future that I'd want to make sure is that, that whatever technology I put on the edge to allow students to have access, to make sure the right student gets in at the right, during the right times, that technology must be NFC based, near field communication. That is a standard. There's going to be two million phones or, or no, over 100 million phones just shipped with Google this year that are NFC enabled. So some of our technologies on campus are proprietary. NFC is an open standard. So some of our technology today that we're actually putting in today as we stand up a new building will not work with a phone. They're not NFC devices, they're proprietary. So it's something that you have to look at when you're looking in your design to make sure that you're on that open standard because students are going to want to what? They're going to want to flash their phone into, to get into a building. And we also know if you've ever been in Europe or Asia Pack, all commerce occurs with a phone. So we have that technology now and we're pushing that technology, not pushing that technology, it's being ripped out from the millennials saying this is what we want, this is how we want to interact. So if I leave you with one th tactical thing from a, from a facilities perspective is make sure your edge devices are open standard NFC based and that will enable you and have a long, long path and not have an obsolescence issue at the edge and have students in some buildings waving their phone and others trying to swipe a card or tap a card. Thank you. Nice job, David. Thank you, David. There is a gentleman who's excited about cool technology and who might need to cut back on the caffeine a little bit too, occasionally. <laughs> so, very nicely done. Uh, Don Sundgren is the Chief Facilities Officer at the University of Virginia. He's got responsibility for construction, renovation, operations, maintenance, and provision of utilities for the university and its associated medical center. Prior to coming to UVA in 2006, he served for many years as an executive with private sector national and international construction firms. He holds a bachelor's and a master's in civil engineering from the University of Cincinnati. Please welcome Don Sundgren. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, how many were in yesterday morning's session on a similar topic here? Yeah, you heard that Steve's job, after uh, Mo and Danny got done, that Steve's job was to kind of land the plane, uh, which he did very effectively. In a previous conversation amongst the three of us, what John said was once, uh, once David scares the heck out of everybody, I need to bring him back in from the ledge. And I'm not sure that that's gonna, we're going to do that right now, though we might. But thinking about it, the ledge is not that bad a place to be. It's got, a, you know, it's got some great views out there. Um, those traditionalists like me, though we've got to be able to open our eyes to see what those uh, great views are. Innovation or tradition, can there be both? Like David said, of course there's going to be both. We're not going to shy away from innovation. By the same token, we're not going to give up the uh, institutions we have today. We're not going to bring those to the ground. So there has to be a balance between the two of them. So it's a matter of adapt adaptation as much as anything. We've been doing that for years and years. A great example, I think it was Danny that mentioned it yesterday, about an invention. He had used a quote from somebody that said, this invention will change the way we teach forever, or something like that. A quote from the mid-1800s. You remember what that invention was? Yeah, the blackboard. Exactly, the blackboard. Uh, well, we lived through that one, successfully adapted, 
And what else? Well, we got white boards, green boards, all, all kind of boards. We even went to overhead projectors for a while. It was a neat board. Uh, but we've got the other thing. We had electricity. We got this instant communication with telephones. We had uh, big mainframe computers and personal computers, and now all these whiz-bang things that David was talking about. And so we, we made it through all that, and we'll continue to make it through this, because it's not a matter of will we adapt or will we accept and welcome innovation and new technology. It's a matter of how well we do it. There's not an if to it, because it's going to happen. Um, David mentioned the rate of change, and the rate of change is accelerating all the time. We know that. And as, as wow as the stuff is today, that David talked about, that others talk about, as wow as that is, when you think about it, uh, today's innovations are really tomorrow's blackboards. We're going to go be going that fast, that far, and we don't know what it is right now. So, University of Virginia, very traditional. Uh, this is an uh, image of the uh, lawn the iconic Jefferson Academical Village in 1870. You can see the rotunda at the north end of the lawn, flanked on the right and left by the lawn, by the uh, east lawn and west lawn. Uh, a mixture of student rooms and pavilions where faculty are residents. On the outboard of that uh, are the range rooms on the east and west, 1870 and today. Iconic, beautiful, John mentioned touchstone, David mentioned touchstone. Uh, traditional, yes, important, yes. The value, absolutely priceless. Priceless in a lot, for a lot of reasons. You think about the draw it has for students to attend UVA, the draw it has for faculty and researchers to come to UVA, and the draw it has for donors to provide funding for UVA and even for the state to provide funding for UVA. Nobody would think, I don't think, I hope, nobody would think about tearing down the rotunda to build a new science building. That's just probably, well, it's not going to happen. Tradition, the value of it. Final exercises on a lawn. This is an image at the conclusion of the walking of the lawn. The students that are getting degrees queue up over by the rotunda, walk from the rotunda south to in front of Old Cabell Hall where they're seated, and they later go to other venues to receive their degrees, but the tradition of walking the lawn is quite a spectacle, very highly valued. Would we do away with that? No, we wouldn't do away with that. So it's a matter of the balance, the balance of tradition and innovation. Again, it's not what if, it's how well we do it. A little bit of background on UVA, because what I'm going to go th do now is just go through a series of slides to talk about what is going on at UVA, what has been going on at UVA and what's going on today in this attempt to marry up tradition with innovation. As John was asking his questions earlier about where are you? Are you, are you seriously on the side of tradition, seriously on the side of innovation? Did you have it just about right? I was watching uh, Jay Klingle from, from Virginia also see when his hand would go up. His went up in the last one that we got it just about right. I don't know if that's right or not. I would hope that if it's not right that we're moving that direction, but these slides will kind of show a little bit about what UVA is doing to marry up the historic, blend it with the new, and the new facilities as well. But as, as far as background is concerned, UVA, as you know, was founded by Thomas Jefferson. 1819, open for classes in 1825, faculty of eight, 68 students. Pretty good student-faculty ratio there. It's the first university, I didn't know this until I was putting the slide together, first university in the U.S. to use the elective course system. Probably pretty innovative for that day. Current enrollment of 21,000, that's about 14,000 undergraduates, about, about 7,000 graduates. Student to faculty ratio is 16 to 1. It's ranked number two as the best public university category by U.S. News and World Report. Number two. Do you know who number one is? But Bob, it's not Clemson. No, dare to dream, man. It's not Clemson. Do you know who number one is? Virginia Tech. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John, who's the next presenter? <laughs> no, it's Cal Berkeley. Cal Berkeley's number one. Uh, ranked number one at best value by Princeton Review. A little bit of, about, the, about the physical plant of UVA. 3,400 acres of land, that's all UVA holdings. It's not all contiguous, it's not all in Charlottesville. 548 buildings, replacement value of about $3 billion. Over the last 20 years, in those 20 years, uh, we saw a tremendous growth at UVA under President John Castine's tenure, he was a 20-year president, retired uh, well, a year ago this past, a year ago in August, yeah, 
Uh, from 1991 to 2011, at UVA, there was 231 major projects completed with a value of about $1.8 billion, an increase in gross square footage from $11 million to $16.3 million, or almost a 50% increase in gross square footage. This year, from this month until December of this year, we will complete 22 projects that total over half a million gross square feet and have a value of a little over $250 million. That's construction value. Right now, the total construction in progress is $370 million. Total in planning and design, $186 million. Back to the lawn again. The rotunda on the right, you can see the pavilions, two pavilions there, pavilions one and three on the center and left, joined by student rooms in between. Pavilion one is um, the occupant is Bob Pianta, who is a dean of the Curry School of Education. Pavilion three, Pat Lamkin, vice president of student affairs for the university. In Jefferson's time, those pavilions were used for faculty residences, but also as teaching space. The ground floor was used as teaching space, gathering space, and they are the same way today. It has not changed. They are that today. We're very fortunate at UVA in that there is such value to Academical Village to preserving and enhancing that tradition that we've got very good funding for projects in Academical Village and doing an overall renewal of Academical Village now. Uh, we've renovated Pavilion 2. We're just finishing the renovation of Pavilion 9. Next year, we'll start the in August, we'll start the renovation of Pavilion 10, Pavilion 2 and Pavilion uh, 9 were each, uh, the renovation of those was 2.1 million each. Pavilion number 10 will be $3 million. We're spending about $3 million a year in Academical Village, upgrading, enhancing Academical Village, and bringing new technology to it. We've got an uh, integrated historic preservation team made up of facilities people as well as the architects, uh, university architects people, who are leading that effort, and again, great support through our endowment, historic preservation endowments. This is Pavilion 10. Pavilion 10, uh, the, 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 the image on the top right is what it was. Lower right is what, we, what it looks like now after uh, a refreshing or renewal that we did a couple of years ago. A couple of differences you can see down below. We took it back to Jeffersonian times, the parapet on the roof, and also the color. The color goes from white to that sand, tan or sand color. As it turns out, that was the color uh, during Jefferson's day. So we're going to start, like I said, next month in a $3 million interior renovation of Pavilion 10. The current occupant is Carl Zeitheimel and his wife. He is a dean of the McIntyre School of Commerce, and he'll be moving out here at the end of this month. At the south end of the lawn is Garrett Hall. It's the last building at UVA that was designed by renowned architect Stanford White. And I guess after he was later, uh, I understand, shot and killed uh, by a jealous husband. But Garrett Hall uh, is just completing a, a, a renovation repurposing of about a $14 million project to take it back, the building to take it back to what it looked like at the turn of the century when it was built. The image down below, the interior, the large room, large interior room, uh, when we started, before we started the renovation, it was cut up in about two or three rooms with a mezzanine, and now it's going back to the way it was in the beginning. That room has, has multiple functions, as an event room, classroom, whatever they want to use it for, and it's going to house the newest school at UVA, which is the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy, enabled by a $100 million donation from uh, Frank Batten. They'll be moving in there next month. Marrying up the uh, old with the new. What you see on the top is an image of the South Lawn Project, 100,000 square feet, $105 million. It's got uh, two buildings that join together with the Commons building, that circular Commons building. The interior of the Commons building is the image below. As you can see, a lot of open spaces, a lot of gathering spaces. There's a Star Starbucks cafe in there. It goes to what David was talking about, that today's students are going to want to collaborate more. They want to have more interaction and also provides for interaction with, uh, with faculty. You can see from the Commons building in the upper image, you can see that that green terrace that goes across, hard to, hard to tell, but it goes across Jefferson Park Avenue to an older building, New Cabell Hall. New Cabell Hall is at the foot of uh, the lawn right now. It's the last building south of the lawn. And uh, it was built in the 1950s. It's about 150,000 square feet. And it is a workhorse building for classrooms and offices. Almost all the students who go through UVA wind up with one or more classes in New Cabell Hall. The intent with the South Lawn Project was to, to demolish New Cabell Hall and replace it with two new buildings. That intent changed a few years ago. 
for two reasons. First of all, the cost of the new buildings was going to be around $120 million. New Cabell Hall renovation was thought to be about $80 million. And with the sustainability initiative and the embedded energy that currently exists in New Cabell Hall, it was decided to renovate New Cabell Hall. And we are going to be starting that work in September, this September. You can see what New Cabell down below, lower image, what New Cabell Hall looks like today. And if you can tell from the screen, you can see the window air conditioning units and all that in there. It's a typical older classroom and office building. It's got painted block walls. It's kind of dark interior, not really well lit. Uh, the furnishings in the classrooms are bolted down uh, seats with little lap tables on them and uh, no new technology in there. So a little over a year ago, we built a mock-up room, a model room, and that's the way this renovation is going to, what's going to be part of this renovation. In the classrooms, there are going to be movable tables. You can set the classroom up however they might choose. And it's got, of course, the enhanced technology, AV equipment, and all that in all the classrooms. On the exterior, there's going to be a curtain wall system up a stairwell with gathering spots on each side to bring light into, harvest light into the stairwell. This is today very dark and, and foreboding. Uh, along the corridors, they'll all be plastered and painted. There'll be glass block put in. Again, harvest light into the corridor. The whole place opens up, refreshes, and will really be, it will re renew a, a, an important asset, a valuable asset of the university. Moving over to the new, this is Rice Hall for the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, you can see um, the top is the rendering, uh, an old rendering actually, before a lot of changes were made, because that's the same view as the view at the bottom. And the bottom is the actual building that's being completed now, and the school will occupy it by the time classes start in the fall of this year. Hopefully, we will have that done. It says we're going to have it done. But interesting, interesting, a couple of interesting aspects of this. You can see, first of all, that all the glass, all the light comes in and so forth. But engineering is in a partnership with Train Corporation to have a living lab in this building. That's one where Train, together with the faculty and students of engineering, will, will conduct research projects on, uh, on air handlers and uh, energy conservation and things of that nature. So as Jay said, when he and I were talking about this a little bit, it was an interesting comment that he made was that this isn't a building that has classrooms. It's a building that is a classroom and really, really brings together all of that in a very effective way. A couple hundred feet away from that is a new um, wet lab building for the College of Arts and Sciences, Physical Life Sciences building. Again, you can see the, obviously the glass and all that in there. But the, the, the interesting part of this too is that, and you heard this yesterday as well, the wet labs themselves are not fixed. They're very open. The furniture, the tables, all the lab, all the lab equipment um, furnishings are movable. The utilities are dropped down from the top, so it becomes move your table over. It's a plug and play kind of a thing. Uh, this building comes online next month as well. It is connected to the old chemistry building. The building was built in 1968, which quite frankly doesn't seem that terribly long ago, but it's a while. The bottom, the rendering, the top is the way it looks today. You can see the scaffold up the outside uh, of the building. That's for a brick replacement project. The water intrusion finally got to the top band of brick, and they're being replaced. But this is, a, this is an old building. It's got the, the old labs, a lot of wet labs, um, but the old sashes, uh, the old fume hoods. Uh, so what's on the capital plan right now is a major renovation of this building to essentially, in phases, gut the building, redo it, to make it more like today's wet lab buildings. The wet lab buildings today, like that building I showed you just a minute ago, the new college building, uh, while it does have wet labs with single pass air, the single pass air is about five or six changes an hour instead of the traditional, what used to be traditional at UVA of 11 or 12 changes per hour. Also, the, the single pass air applies only to the wet labs, not to the offices. The systems are separate for the two chill beams on the offices. A sister building of the old chemistry building is Gilmer Hall that was built uh, in 1962. At the top, you can see what it looks like today with that very, very attractive uh, screen wall and pigeon dwelling in the front. At the, uh, in the bottom is what it looked like back in the day. This building was considered, do we demolish this building or do we renovate the building? It was decided to renovate the building and repurpose it, primarily because the structure is so good. It's a concrete frame structure just like that new a physical Life Sciences building I showed you a couple slides ago. The same column spacing, the same base sizes, a little less floor to floor than the new building, but, it, but suitable floor to floor. Right now, this building has 
some wet labs in it, it's got other research space in it, and it's got vivaria in it. And because of its age and because of the way it's been changed through the years, the mechanical systems, as you can imagine, the MEP systems, don't support the current usage of the building. So the idea here is, in a, again, in a number of phases, to uh, decant, gut, and rebuild the building from the interior, keeping the exterior as it is now. The pro two projects together, the chemistry building and Gilmer Hall together, are thought to be about $125 million worth of renovation work. In the School of Architecture, I'm just real quickly on this slide, we put two new additions on the School of Architecture a couple of years ago. One is, uh, the top one is uh, offices, faculty offices that open up into a, into a large student area, as well as some studio spaces. Down below is interesting, that's studio spaces. Both of these were designed by faculty members of the, the School of Architecture, W.G. Clark and, uh, and Bill Sherman. Bavaro Hall, Curry School of Education, completed last year, 65,000 gross square feet. I only show this slide because, again, it, it emphasizes the, today's thoughts about what we need for gathering spaces and communication spaces, the slide, the, the image down below. Beautiful, beautiful building. It connects uh, via colonnades. It connects to Ruffner Hall, which is, a, which is the home of the School of Education. Ruffner Hall has on the books a $22 million renovation that we expect to be able to start next summer, about this time. Dormitories were mentioned yesterday. I just tossed this slide in. We're, doing, we're redoing all the first-year dorms along Alderman Road. Um, and essentially what we're doing is demolishing a number of the dorms, building new dorms. We're in the second phase of a three-phase, three or four-phase project on that right now. The difference here, and you heard Danny Flanagan talk of it yesterday, the difference here is that the new dorms, first of all, will, will have conditioned space. They'll be air-conditioned. The current dorms are not air-conditioned. David mentioned how... Uh, new buildings, great, but they're, in, but they're used, uh, higher use of energy, which is very true. Uh, they also have, on each floor, at the knuckle of each floor, they have common spaces, gathering spaces. Also, the, the first floor is nothing but common spaces. And again, they're, they're teched up the way they need to be for today. Don't know what it's going to be like tomorrow, but for today anyway. We've got a, a rather unique situation at UVA in that we are the home of the JAG School, Judge Advocate General School. Uh, we own the building, you can see it down below and then up above. Uh, we own the building and we lease it to JAG. Right now we're doing a BOQ renovation, a brick replacement on that building. Just, a, just an excellent partnership with JAG. They add a lot to the university. They work closely with the law school that's adjacent to the JAG school, north of uh, the main grounds, and add a lot to the local community as well. Moving over to the health system, this is the Claude Moore Medical Education Building that was completed last year. You can see the drum on the, in the top image and down below the auditorium. Uh, this is interesting in that it uses simulation technology where medical students actually perform operations on things that look and act very much like people do and react in the same way. Um, John's group did a lot of work on the medical education building, just as they did a lot of work, and he might explain it when he gets up here, a lot of work on the two research buildings I showed you, the one for engineering and the one for the College of Arts and Sciences. Staying in the health system for a minute, we do have a hospital, a major medical center. Right now we're completing a project that puts a new front, a six-story front on that medical center that uh, has about 72 new beds, all private rooms, all looking out, their view looking toward us, out to the north. Uh, latest technology in the rooms, latest technology in the hospital, and that is combined with major renovations throughout the hospital as things move around to accommodate the new patient rooms and new flow within the hospital. Across the street from the hospital, Emily Kerr Clinical Cancer Center, which came online just a few months ago, state of the art, interesting about the, the change of technology. After the building was designed, after we were in construction, after the building was dried in, some of the equipment changed, or I should say the, the, the using community selected different, different type of equipment, the newer te equipment, newer technology than was thought of when the building was designed. So it meant going into the first floor, doing a lot of reinforcement of the structural steel, taking out the, the, the foundation and putting in a new, new foundation for the new equipment, uh, you know, which, which you know, we talked about the rate of change a little bit. Right now, what's it, what's it take to take a project from conception to when it's, it's used in occupancy? That's a, normally a, what, a three to five year period, something like that. So 
how does technology change in that three to five years? How do you look forward to see what you ought to be designing that building for? Uh, because you don't even know what it's going to be like when you get there. Uh, so best, the best we can do uh, probably is to make it as flexible and adaptive as we can during the programming and also for all of us, facilities people, IT people, everybody else to be so closely involved with those that are doing the, the development of the project, the pro programming of the project, not just the design and the construction, but the, the thought of it and the programming of it along the way, an integrated team approach. The battle building at New Children's Hospital near the medical center, it started construction a couple of months ago. It'll be done about mid-2014, 200,000 row square feet, all the new technology in that building. Finally, all of our facilities, existing facilities and new facilities have to be supported by our infrastructure. And this is an image of a new chiller plant that we'll start construction on in the late fall or early next year, late fall this year, early next year. The chiller plant will initially house 6,000 tons of chilled water capacity, but the building's being built for 10,000 tons, so we can add another 4,000 as the health system demand demands it. And this, this chiller plant, like the others in that loop, are primarily for the health system, medical center and the research buildings associated with the health system. So that was all on what UVA is trying to do. I hope Jay is right. I hope we're at the right place or at least moving in the right direction. Um, in thinking about this a little bit, you know, this, some of this stuff for some of us is, is kind of scary because it's difficult to keep up. It's difficult to keep up with the pace of change. It's difficult to imagine where we're going to need to be a few years from now, and sometimes it's more comfortable to say, let's slow this train down a little bit, but we don't have a choice in that because it's like I said starting out, it's not a matter of if, it's, if we're gonna be able to do it, it's a matter of how well we do it. And it helps, it helps me at least to remember what our job is. What is our business? And I think it was said in a session yesterday or maybe in the SFO conference the other day, our business is to educate, period. It's not merely to conduct classes in a classroom, but it is to educate. So anything that enables us to educate better, Anything that enhances our ability to educate winds up being a good thing to do. So we should not shy away from this. We have to do it in a way that makes sense. We have to do it in a way that we don't lose the value of our traditions. By the same token, we should welcome, welcome innovation and even seek it out because our job is, after all, to educate. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Nice job. And I would say if you've not been to his campus at the University of Virginia, I would highly suggest that you make the effort to do so. It's in a gorgeous part, the western part of the state of Virginia, and the campus itself is just fabulous. So uh, if we could get to my slides, there we go. Tradition. Now just because something's old doesn't make it a tradition. Is there anybody here from Ohio State by chance? This is an Ohio State classroom from the 1880s or so, not long after the Civil War, believe it or not. And if you look at it, what do you see? Well, you see a vertical writing surface, a large projected image, students sitting passively and taking notes. Well, that's a long ways from where we are today, right? Because now in North America, we spend $5 billion on higher ed campuses building classrooms, smart classrooms, so-called smart classrooms, like what you see pictured at the bottom. And what do you see? Well, you see a vertical writing surface, in this case, hidden by the screen. You see a large projected image and you see students who, unfortunately, all too often are still sitting passively and taking notes without changing the learning experience. 10 or 15 years ago, the bottom right picture, that was considered to be innovative. And there was a big rush on campuses to, to upgrade all of your classrooms to become smart classrooms, right? But that's not really innovation, innovation anymore. And there's all kinds of different ways of laying out classrooms and learning spaces to be far more effective, far more active and engaged. And there's just a couple of examples there. Some of them were talked about yesterday. And I'm sure you're familiar with places like uh, scale-up uh, style rooms, that, that type of thing. And spaces that, that create opportunities for engagement in active learning. They don't have to be brand new $100 million buildings. It doesn't have to be new construction whatsoever. If you look at this, this is a very effective, small, inexpensive renovation of three old and decrepit classrooms, frankly. Death by PowerPoint kind of teaching spaces into a long bowling alley, long skinny bowling alley of a, of a space, but that geometry actually fits that teaching style very nicely because that teaching style benefits from having a flat screen display and a traditional whiteboard assigned to every one of those round tables. 
So the more perimeter space that you have, the better off you are as the classroom. So you could take a space like what's shown above and look at that long, skinny bowling alley of, of an envelope and say, well, what can we possibly do with that? Well, with a little bit of innovation, a little bit of creativity, you can create some learning spaces that are quite effective. Now, I, I don't want to mention the university, but I, want, I wandered into a university building recently, and just with my cell phone, I took a couple of different pictures from a couple of different space types. And you see on, the one on the, on the right is one of these collaborative, actively engaged classrooms, similar to a scale-up. Not exactly scale-up, but similar. And you can see that students are engaged. You can see the instructors walking around, not lecturing at the front of the room, but actually doing coaching and counseling with, with each student group. And that same building on a different floor also had very traditional lecture halls. And that person is in the front row, was one of five or six people sleeping in the very front row. <laughs> that was the best one I could get a picture of. <laughs> um, the challenge is that even thinking along those lines, in addition to the facilities challenges and such, is it's going to change the, the role that the faculty plays because they're no longer standing up and lecturing. They're no longer doing what I'm doing right now, which is hoping to entertain you and educate, ed educate you and persuade you, right? But they're walking around and working with small groups and working one-on-one -on -one and coaching and counseling and taking the, the bulk of the information de dissemination and they're putting that online and using many of the technologies that David was, was talking about earlier, right? So that's one of the big challenges. The other challenge is how is it that we can anticipate where technology is going, right? The faculty and getting them to teach differently is quite difficult. The, the other side of that is how is it that we can anticipate this technology? So look at the Google hits there for just a number of items that are now part of our everyday vocabulary that were just not even part of our lexicon at all 10 years ago. It'd be interesting to see 10 years from now we do that same exercise Something like Google Plus, which is just now getting started. You know, even, even a year ago, there would have been no hits on Google Plus. There was no such, such thing. If Google Plus takes off the way that they hope it will, it would have similar numbers, millions and millions of hits 10 years from now. Right? What else is coming that's going to impact the way that your students and your faculty want to use your buildings? The other part of that is what technologies are actually going to make it? And at what part of the cycle are they going to be when you're making very important decisions about your buildings? You know, this is a rather famous uh, hype cycle for technology. And if you study it for just a minute, I think you'll see that it, it rings true on a number of different technologies. Starting with something that's a technology trigger, and all of a sudden there's a, a lot of um, hype about it, and it brings the peak of inflated expectations, unfortunately soon to be followed by the trough of disillusionment, which I, I love that title. <laughs> Not all technologies do this. You know, things like DVD players and digital cameras and things that that were just extensions of what you're already doing, they didn't really go through that trough of disillusionment and that big fall. Something truly disruptive like the iPod didn't have to go through that. But think of other technologies that are, that are going through that and where they might be. How about Second Life? Three years ago, Second Life was maybe at that peak of inflated expectations, and everybody on your campus was talking about, oh, we have to create these avatars and these, these virtual worlds, 3D, so that avatars can go in there and they can learn, and this will be replacing our, our brick and mortar classrooms. Well, where is it now? How many people, raise your hand, if you've got a serious Second Life effort on your campus that's ongoing and active and vibrant and impacting your job? I don't think there's a single hand raised. Right? Where are we now with, with Second Life? Well, with virtual worlds uh, in general. Well, we're in the trough of disillusionment at this point. And I think eventually we're going we're gonna to all of a sudden uh, start, start up that slope of enlightenment and get to a productivity uh, plateau that makes sense for that, that particular technology. So... It's difficult to anticipate where those technologies are, are coming, and that complicates your job. So let me ask you a couple of questions. And again, we'll, we'll do this by, uh, by raised hands, give you a chance to, to uh, weigh in here, and then we'll move into our question and answer session. So on your campus, what's the biggest barrier to innovation? So pick one of these, if you would, please. And by show of hands, how many would say cost, finances, is the biggest barrier to innovation? Yeah, not as many hands as you might think. How about time? Lack of staff to, to develop those projects, to follow up on those projects, support those projects. A smattering of hands in the back. Organizational structure just doesn't support that. Okay? Unclear how to innovate. A lack of vision, lack of a plan. Okay? We're pretty, pretty spread on this one, it seems like. How about the people, the culture? Pretty good number there. Are there others? Did we, did, did we miss any that you want to shout out? 
Say it again. All of the above. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Anything else? Which group on your campus is the biggest barrier to innovation? Study that list for a moment. We'll, let's run through this as well. The Board of Regents or the trustees or whatever your governance board is at the highest level. How many people think that that's the biggest barrier to, to innovation? Not many, just a couple of hands on that one. How about the president and other high administration, administrative levels? Your presidents are here, aren't here. You're allowed to vote on that one. <laughs> okay. How about the facilities department? Whatever it is that you might call it, building and grounds. <laughs> Not a single hand on that one, okay? <laughs> How about other admin staff that don't fall into those groups? Okay, a couple, three, four hands. Faculty? Whoa. <laughs> we know where the bad guys are, the, the barriers to, to innovation. How about students? Not a single hand. No surprise there. And on your campus, which group is the biggest protector of tradition? Again, let's start. <laughs> How many people are going to say faculty? <laughs> All right, let's skip the rest of the question then. Huh? <laughs> All right. Sure. Oh, <laughs> that's not fun. <laughs> yeah, where's the chalk after all that? Okay, so let's entertain some questions. And just like yesterday, we would appreciate it if you wander up to the microphones. If you're willing to do that, uh, we, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you're not willing to do that and you just want to raise your hand and shout it out, then uh, that will work as well. Um, and we, we, again, we've got Steve up here to, to uh, supplement the, our speakers and help us with uh, answering the questions. So. Who's got some questions for our distinguished panel of guests here? You don't have to walk up to the microphone if you don't really want to. <laughs> Go ahead. The question is related to IPTV and the, the timing of when that might become come a bit more mainstream than it is right now. And uh, apparently there's consideration of, uh, of updating the, the cable plant infrastructure. Uh, it, it's an outstanding question and, and there's no perfect um, answer to that. I, I would give you my opinion that there's no question that IPTV is coming. Um, it's coming in full force. It's, it's probably on a number of campuses that are represented in, in this room. Uh, how many people have IPTV right now? You're running your television services, broadcast television services over your, your data network rather than over a, a coax traditional cable television. Okay, so you're seeing a number of hands already. Uh, certainly that's the forward thinking way of doing that right now. You will certainly pay a cost premium uh, to do that. If you think about the, the technology adoption curve, the early adopters are the ones who are raising their hands. The innovators actually are the ones who are raising their hands right now. And in my opinion, in another 18 months, it's going to jump the, 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 the chasm there to where it's, it's basically um, uh, more towards the early adopters and, and you're going to have a whole lot of campuses that are, that are moving in that direction. So if it's a, a project that you're planning right now, I think you would be wise to be planning that uh, that way with the IPTV. I don't know if others want to, to uh, weigh in on that. I agree. I mean, absolutely. As much bandwidth as possible. Absolutely. As much bandwidth as possible is the, is the answer. Go ahead. Uh, I, I'm Dennis Bailey with Florida State University, and uh, I was first going to ask Don for a loan, but uh, <laughs> actually, we need a grant. We, a loan, loan won't really work. 
<laughs> but but the real question that I think might get an honest answer is we talked about the idea that it takes a while to get through a building program design construction um, scenario and the technology can change several generations during that scenario and uh, um, Don you mentioned being flexible I think that's exactly the right thing to do my question is how, how what exactly do you do or who, who maybe has some best practice examples of how you build that flexibility into a construction project yeah, let me, let me try that, and uh, Steve, you can help out with that also. With, um, with flexibility, and everybody, you know, kind of wants to do that, build flexible spaces, you do a renovation, make it flexible. But flexible, then, as you know, doesn't come cheap. It doesn't come free. It doesn't come cheap. It's, it's very, very expensive. Um, Danny Flanagan talked yesterday about flexible dormitories to where they can be used for undergraduate students, graduate students, families, whatever, you just change them around. Uh, probably to, in today's climate, that's probably cost prohibitive to do that. But around what to do flexibly, what makes sense to do with flexibility, what value you get out of, major, most value you get out of the biggest bang for your buck, I think that probably depends on the type of facility that you're, you're going to build. And I think you probably got to bring, bring a, a group in there to deal with that, not just the professionals that we hire to consult with us and help us, but also within the university, like I said, the IT people, facilities people, and so forth, there's got to be a balance between what, you're, what you can spend money on and what you want to spend money on, what's worth it and what's not worth it. And that might have to do with, with, uh, with how you wire a building, uh, wiring for full MEP systems and all that, and what you do with the flexibility of the systems. It's easy to deal with walls and things like that, more difficult to deal with systems. So I think it's the system flexibility. May, perhaps that uh, we should focus on. Steve? Yeah, I'd, I would agree with Don. I think, I think flexibility on a, a general office building is going to be pretty easy to accomplish. Uh, but once you get into more complex buildings, flexibility is going to cost a lot more money. And this gets us back into this whole total cost of ownership issue. If you're looking at a 50-year building, uh, how do you how do you plan? I mean, it's not just the next five years, it's the next 10 years, it's the next 20 years. Building that sort of flexibility means probably larger floor to ceiling heights, uh, mm -hmm. more interstitial space for air handling systems. So we're talking about things that people who are immediately going to own the building don't really want to pay for. And so this is going to be a challenge in terms of kind of changing the institutional perspective on this idea of flexibility and long-term use of buildings and the change that they go through. I think the question about bandwidth, and I, uh, it, I get back to this issue as a utility problem. Yeah, we, we, we want all the bandwidth we can use. More bandwidth is better. But at some point, you get back to Don's adding a chilling station. Um, he's got 6,000 tons in it, and he's planning for... 10. But if he goes beyond 10, he's got to build another chilling station. So if you plan for X amount of bandwidth, you've put in so much infrastructure to provide that, and you go beyond that, and you've got, you've got to buy more infrastructure. And the same way for the building. There's a limited amount of pathway, and at some point, pathways, the cable, the infrastructure that transmits the signal is going to get more effective, but you're still limited to pathway. Uh, I, one of the issues for me is density. We're looking at energy density on our campus, where, the, where everything is located. And I think if you looked at IT density, you'd find that IT density is related to energy density. Mm -hmm. you, we're probably going to have to distribute our, our load around campuses more effectively than we are now, mm -hmm. both energy and IT. So I think it's looking at this from a, sim, a, a simple way but maybe a more complex way, distributing things. How do we distribute this, all of this stuff that's happening? You're going to pack everybody into the center of campus. What does that mean about energy, IT, and just getting people around? And when you, <clears throat> when you densify, as we're, as we're doing as well, when you densify, you're really taking over surface parking and things like that. But then you've also, for sustainability and a lot of other reasons, you want to have green spaces. So you want to densify, but yet increase the amount of green space that you have, which is a little bit 
on the tricky side. Dennis, just one of the comment. I can't loan you any money, man. We are doing a lot of building, but you guys have got a great jumbotron. <laughs> 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 Next question. I understand that if you have the mic, you have power. So. Yes, you have power. <laughs> anyway, I, I did want to ask a little bit more about the use of cell phone technology for access into buildings. We have a tendency at universities to want to make our systems very reliable. We could make an application very reliable or procure an application that was very reliable but are the cell phones going to be very reliable especially when they're being provided by many 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 different service providers so and the answer is when you travel abroad those devices are highly reliable because they're based on a common standard, the NFC standard. We don't have that in the States today. That's been the hurdle. We've had the technology to take a lot of things to the phone, but there's not a standard. So when you, when, for instance, if, if you're traveling in, in Japan, you will never see someone pull out a wallet for anything. It's all on the phone. The other beauty about the NFC is even if your battery goes dead, there's enough in the chip itself to wake it up. And that's another important thing about the NFC. So NFC was designed, it came out in 2000, they started uh, back in 2004, so it's NFC 1. There's a lot of um, usage around the world, it's just not in the States, um, because the rest of the world didn't have anything, so they jumped to the newest standard, whereas the States is pretty entrenched with some proprietary technology. Um, around um, HIDI class, uh, PROX. So it, it is highly reliable and it also deals with the battery issue. I mean, how many, the more drain, the more services we're asking of our mobile devices, the more they drain battery, right? The, the bottleneck is around power on those devices. So what's nice about the NFC is you can wake it up it's, it, through, and even though your battery's down the phone, it'll wake up. Um, it may not present, as we're designing, it may not be able to present the image of that student. So when you go near a device, it warms, visually warms the student's face, encrypted, and it may not be able, so your campus security may say, you know, I need to see your ID, power's dead, that may not happen, but it at least it'll, it'll wake up against any device and they'll know, well, you've got someone's phone, it may not be the right person's <laughs> phone, but you have someone's phone. But, um, the technology is uh, here now, and uh, again, I, said, I think Google's going to bring in all the manu major manufacturers are coming with that NFC in 2011, and Google's expecting 100 million to, they're, they're ambitious, but they're expecting 100 million to be out there. So it's there. And right now, the contactless technology, for instance, that we're using on campus today is all NFC based. Great. Thank you, Dave. I just had a question regarding uh, uh, innovation and external barriers to the innovation. So uh, as, as a matter of example, we've had a, several situations where we've tried to uh, use new technology or uh, something as simple as waterless urinals. Building code prevented us from doing that. Um, we have a situation where uh, in animal facilities we implemented some uh, opportunities to reduce ventilation air exchange rate. Uh, but the certification agency refused to let us reduce the air exchange rate as low as we could. We could. Uh, so is there any thought on how do, how do we sync up uh, these other regulatory agencies or building codes, as the case may be, uh, to keep up with the technology change? Let me just one yeah, quick comment on that, and others can chime in. <coughs> um, a comment was made earlier, <coughs> earlier in this uh, session, I don't remember by whom, about uh, higher education being sometimes glacial in the way it, it moves. And certainly at higher education, and we all tend to be risk adverse. But if, if we are that way, regulatory agencies are, you know, they, they got us beat, hands down. <laughs> um, we haven't run into the waterless urinal issue you're talking about. Uh, we moved away from those but uh, for maintenance issues. but. I uh, haven't run into that, but obviously you do run into code issues. Codes are being revised all the time. Codes are being upgraded. Codes, our building codes are, do not keep up with our technology. 
Uh, they're playing catch up all the time. I don't know what we can do about that except be the pull, try to pull them along and, uh, and, and, see, and see what can be done with that because you're right, they do not enable us to make use of technologies that would be appropriate be, just because the code hasn't caught up yet. Uh, and I, I, whether you're dealing with a city agency or a state agency or some kind of national code compliance, I would agree that those are often challenges to innovation, but, uh, but they often drive us to figure out new ways to do things. And uh, I don't know who else is dealing with mass notification on your campus, but uh, you were talking about proprietary systems, and I don't know of many things that are more proprietary than fire alarm systems. Yet we're trying to integrate all these things so that we can provide, uh, you know, effective communication, the kind of communication that our campus expects. Uh, but that's an area where, you know, everybody's trying to innovate and create new opportunities. I also think, and I'm not, I, this is, I often, I, once I heard a Greenpeace person talk about um, there might be some possible benefits to nuclear power. So what I'm going to say is probably along the same lines <laughs> as that. Uh, I think the NFPA is doing some interesting things, uh, in particularly in regards to mass notification and fire safety, in trying to recognize that there are new ways of doing that. So I don't think that code agencies can be totally uh, or are totally not innovative in nature. And I also think we have the opportunity in some of these entities, uh, because of our participation, the participations in our class, in our uh, from our campuses, to push them in ways that cause them to think about that. We have faculty who can bring uh, credibility to new ideas and new ways of doing things that I think are very valuable. The air change issue has been both faculty driven and uh, compliance driven from our EHS offices. But, you know, we got to kind of a, you know, somebody stepped over that edge and uh, got some agreement. And then through the network that we all have around the country, we're able to say, yeah, but they're doing this at Virginia or they're doing this at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, well-respected institutions are changing things, we can follow along. So I, I think we need to find out where the innovators are and, and shamelessly steal from them. <laughs> shamelessly steal and then improve. Allow yourself to be stolen from the next time. Great. It was apparent by the show of hands in this room that the faculty appear to be the stumbling block or the resistors to this transformation that we're talking about in classroom technology, especially tenured faculty. What best practices have you experienced in trying to get the faculty moving along early on in this process, getting them engaged in this process so they're no longer resistors of this transformation? Well, that, that has been the bane of my existence for the last 15 years, frankly. Uh, um, so, so I have some thoughts on it. I can't say that I've got uh, documented proof and, and a whole lot of success at it in, in many ways. Uh, but, but one of the things that, that I've been suggesting to, to campuses most recently, uh, very early on in the design process, the, the foundational decisions are made. And it's not a matter of which annotation tablet to use or, or whether a document camera will be there or not. The, but far more foundational, critical decisions are made very early on, such as do we want to teach in tiered lecture halls or do we want to teach in scale-up style rooms, just to use an example uh, of, of two extremes. And, and often, in my opinion, uh, bad decisions are made, frankly, early on because of the concern that the deans and the other decision makers have about their faculty. And when the dean does not see any way of getting their faculty from where they are today to where they need to be in three years when that building opens, if they don't see that there's a path there, Unfortunately, that dean will often make bad decisions here. And it was mentioned yesterday about a brand new science building that uh, was quite unfortunate, some of the decisions that, that were made. Um, and, and I think that was because there was no clear path. So we need to show them what that path is on how they can get their faculty to accept this new way of teaching, to realize that that's what their students are going to pay for, and they're not going to pay for sitting in a, in a lecture hall again. They're just not. There are way too many options out there, and they're going to vote with their wallet they're not going to do that. So that while the faculty thinks that they're, uh, that they're maintaining status quo, students aren't going to let them do that. The faculty needs to, to learn how to rewrite their curriculum, frankly, and to be able to, to have the time to go through and, and rewrite their curriculum. Because they're going to teach very differently in a class where it's problem-based learning 
where the learning, where the dissemination of information actually happens outside of class online and where the struggling with the information and the, the actively engaged with that information and the participation, all that happens within the classroom now rather than lecture. So you, you take the classroom model and you totally flip that. Well, the, 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 the faculty has a long ways to go in that three year period. And so I think to get them from, uh, from where they are now to where they're going to be is going to take a series of structured seminars, workshops, however you want to term that. It's going to be a, a faculty development uh, curriculum, essentially, that needs to be delivered. And it could be somebody coming from off campus, it could be somebody from on campus. I'm not sure that it matters uh, about how to do that, but it needs to be somebody who's experienced in experiential active learning styles and, and not who's experienced in a traditional stand and deliver method. And uh, I'm very early on with this, frankly, about, about showing here's the path and, and, and here's what the opportunities are for you to have every quarter uh, a, a workshop, you know, a day-long workshop where the faculty is actually given some, uh, given some assignments, essentially, about taking their existing curriculum and rewriting them to be effective in, in those new teaching styles. Um, so there's not, that's, there's not a great answer there in terms of, of uh, documented success, but, but that's the process that I've been suggesting campuses follow. Are if there I, others that, go ahead. If I may, from the academic side, what, what I've seen, um, even pre-Blackboard being on campuses, uh, deans that um, actively uh, change, it's a, creating awareness is critical, and then that journey of education. I've seen deans use, use student surveys very, very effectively. Uh, students are unabashed about providing comments, and, and they change the type of surveys to ask um, really compare and contrast questions. Not only how is your teacher, in our case, using technology, is it effective? Are they just putting a syllabus up on the web and saying, yes, I do do this. I'm, I'm in a blended learning model. Um, from that end of the spectrum, you know, if, if this, how do you rate this teacher? Is there a teacher on campus that you have that does an excellent job in this? And when they start asking that question, the context becomes different and the deans have created awareness saying, you know, this is the program we're going to put in place and we're going to look at with our instructional designers and look at pedagogy, but this is awareness. Your students are saying this. Mm -hmm. And so when, they, when they're aware and your consumer is, is pulling them. So I think creating awareness in the students' surveys have been very effective when properly written. And if they're measured, and I understand tenure, and that's, mm -hmm. that's another opportunity. Uh, but awareness, even with tenured professors, is, is important, especially when a colleague uh, is being brought up or held up by students and mentioned specifically that, boy, that's, that's a lighthouse there. That's, that's what engages us in class. Very good. Go ahead. Uh, three quick issues. Uh, two of them perhaps more like announcements and asking if there's anybody with experience, maybe just after the session that they m may want to identify themselves. Uh, we've been, uh, well, firstly, I come from South Africa and uh, water is uh, not very... Uh, uh, much available there. So we are looking at the things which apparently have been installed and developed in the Scandinavian countries and have been installed in Brazil and countries like that, which is a vacuum toilet system similar to what you have in aircraft because it really uses a lot less water. So if there's anybody here that uh, have any experience, I'd like to perhaps just have a word. The second one is uh, in terms of these uh, teaching spaces, anybody who has experience of taking LED lighting down to the sort of task level to reduce the energy, I'd like to uh, perhaps hear about that. My question really to the panel uh, is with these new approaches to teaching spaces, do you find in practice a, a limitation to when those type of venues don't work any longer that you go more than 100 seats or 150 or whatever it is, is there a, is there a physical limitation when it's a, it stops working? So there's three parts to that. It, what's your name, please? I'm Philip. Philip. So if, if anyone in the crowd has some advice or some uh, best practices or, or anything to share with Philip about the two topics he brought up, go ahead and seek him uh, afterwards, if you would. Uh, and then the third question, or the third topic there, was about... Uh, the learning spaces and what happens when, uh, when the learning spaces cease to, to function well and, and, and what do we do at that point? 
We haven't seen them on our campus long enough to decide whether there's a break point on size. I'm a little concerned that we may want to see them get too small and that you're going to invest a lot of infrastructure in, a, in, in technologizing a space for 15 people when mm -hmm. that's really probably what you need to do. And there's probably going to be a need to monitor how many people use those spaces. So if you've got a space for 50, you want to make sure that it's utilized effectively and that's kind of out of our realm. Uh, I think at some point you're going to end up being in a room like this with a high ceiling because if, you're, if you've got 300 people in that bowling alley room, mm -hmm. you're going to feel like you're not in a classroom, more like a cave. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some design issues that are going to, mm -hmm. going to change the configurability of these, these spaces. Uh, I'm going to be real interested in seeing how big they can get. I think primarily the, the spaces that are being designed now to support this more active learning, the studio model, the scale up, that type of thing, are flat floor and rectangular in nature. Uh, d don't necessarily have that high ceiling, as you say. You, can, yeah. you have to watch that because you don't want it to feel like a cave. But on the other hand, for the most part, you're not looking all the way across the room for a large projected image because you have something that's closer to you and, and they're distributed displays all over the room. So by its very nature, you are designing and building spaces that are ultimately more, far more flexible than the old style of tiered lecture halls and, and that type of thing. So I, I think in the long term, uh, I think you're, you're going to be better off with the flat floor flexible spaces that are, that are all the vogue now. My question is not that much about uh, the projection areas and that you can take into the technology, but it's the ratio now of whatever is best facilitating or teaching with that group and interaction in that configuration. Are there limitations there or, or not? From the teaching perspective, I think you're going to have to have when I teach, I teach a very small group, but if I was to double that, I'd feel like there'd need to be at least one more of me in that space. Mm -hmm. So there's probably going to be more teaching assistants mm -hmm. with faculty who are involved in these spaces. Yeah. I think that the method of teaching, the pedagogy that is supported so well by these spaces, it really is the, the pedagogy that, that teachers prefer. Uh, uh, maybe not the old time faculty who are so entrenched in lecture, but if you rewind the clock a bit, uh, why did they get into teaching? It probably has a whole lot more to do with the, the, the smaller group one-on-one -on -one counseling and coaching than it does standing in front of you know, 200 students in lecture. So, go ahead. So um, we, we've talked about the new generations pulling the information, you know, pulling us into, into their technology. Well, these students hopefully will be facilities managers. We're all going to be gone. Hmm. And we need to attract them, yet in our discipline. We don't bring a lot of technology. We, we have a hard time um, having our, fac our, our administration say, you know, this. yes, you can buy the new tools, you can have the smartphones, you can have the tablets to do your job, and we could do a lot with those. So how do you, on your campuses, um, with Blackboard, whatever, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we bring the technology, and how do we attract these students into our field? So if I, Traditional I mean, and innovation. Right. Okay. So if I, <laughs> a, a microcosm into, into that, um, I do believe the millennials, they want to be engaged. You ask and they're there and they're there in numbers. They're, they're very passionate about sustainability. I think that's an area where if you start talking about sustainability and getting their input and getting their research around sustainability and viability of space, they get very much engaged in that. Um, they're they're participating. Victorian nature, that, that's what it is. I will say in our office in San Francisco where all our mobile developers are, we had a traditional issue because we had some uh, a document management system with workflow, which is very pragmatic developers, and then we had these young um, uh, millennials that are, are creative, and we were trying to put them in the same building. And what we literally had to do was split them by floor because the traditionalists wanted to find space dark and they wanted to write code. It was kind of like th throwing meat into a cage. <laughs> and, and on the top floor, and they wanted walls. On the top floor, the, the mobile developers wanted no walls. They wanted good technology displays around the perimeter and they wanted beanbag chairs. 
So from a facilities perspective, I'm like, wow, that's a budget check I can write up top. <laughs> that's, that's easy. <laughs> and it floats. So is there compare and contrast? So traditionals, I would argue, is harder to get to the table. The millennials, they want to get involved, and they took a great deal of pride in their space because it was a living space, a, a socializing space, a learning space, and a collaborative space. So I think if you ask, or if you ask to get students involved, especially around sustainability, um, you'll have hordes of students, honestly, that want to engage with you, and then you can mentor them to be the future leaders. Yeah, just a comment, something, uh, I think it's not an answer, just a comment. That's going to be very, very interesting is how the profile of facilities changes uh, here over the next number of years. Uh, how we do our trades work in a different way, how we do it with different people, how what impact technology has on that, not just the technologies that we use as facilities people, but the technology of the stuff we're working on as it gets more and more sophisticated and advances and changes more frequently. So it's going to be very interesting to, to watch that change. There's, I think there's just a, a world of opportunity there in facilities as this thing, as this thing goes forward. But we've got to kind of look out as best we can ahead to see what it is that we think we need to look like in a few years and figure out how to get from where we are today to where it is that we need to look like and not quite sure what that, what that is right now. If I may, one more practical. So I don't know how often you all use interns, but if you, you set out an intern for sustainability and, mm -hmm. and either institutional work study or, or Title IV goes to supporting that position so it's not a... A, a budget drag, I think getting some interns in and have an intern for sustainability on your staff would be a nice way to get that going and enable working with the financial aid office actually supporting the funding of that student. I think that's some good advice. Thank you. One last question. Go ahead. Okay, I'll do two then. Um, <laughs> I think there's some interesting opportunities that have uh, popped up today and in some other things, interesting opportunities for APA for the facilities world. First, um, I've heard comments up here on facilities and, you know, we really, as we're looking at some of the renovations, we're in the middle of renovating some of the 60s and 70s buildings. Um, they're built like forever. They don't necessarily look real nice for all the architects, I apologize. But I think uh, there's a comment that Don, I think, made as we look at total cost of ownership, but really the life cycle analysis and picking up that first cost embedded energy was brought up. Yeah. I think embedded energy is something we haven't monetized yet, and I think it will probably get us a little more room, Steve, as we look at trying to make the case for Florida ceiling heights, for exterior envelope, for structure, that we can have a 100-year building, but that building may have many lives during that 100 years that we can more economically go in and do it. So I think there's opportunities. I think Doug is doing some things that maybe can pick up embedded energy as another evaluation factor. The other area that we're talking about right now, and I think that we're making uh, some grounds, uh, some progress, is the faculty and getting them to use the technology. We're finding they'll use it if it's much like a utility system, if it's reliable, if there's responsive help, if there's a helpline, if there's somebody proactively testing the systems in the morning before they get there to ensure they're up and operating. We've convinced them to start looking much like we're doing maintenance, zoning out some of the IT support so they're responsible for buildings, they're responsible for classrooms, they can pull up all the technology at five o'clock in the morning, see what's off and take care of it. But if the professor needs something, they're on a 911 call. First, they can call them on a cell phone, and they can work it from behind without going anywhere. But if it's really a problem, they can go forward and do some things. If it's really bad, we actually have roll-in systems that replaces the whole system. If they get a comfortable feeling that it's going to be there, it's going to be reliable, there's responsive help, then I think you have a much better effort doing all the training and that kind of thing that has to happen. But I think that's where facilities people can offer that utility concept, can offer that reliability concept, can do the total cost of ownership and looking at that embedded energy for buildings and make the case to leadership. Now, it's taken us five years to get the budget message across, but they're starting to hire people. It ties right back to our much more technologically complex buildings that we're building. We just did a nanoscale science and engineering building. 
we're hiring a full-time research assistant to help all the PIs work all the stuff inside the building and allow us to still maintain the basic systems in the building. And it's that relationship we're going to have to feel our way through. But for right now, we have a dotted line relationship. And the budget money is in our budget to hire that person. So it's, there's some real opportunities out there. The faculty are their own challenge, but I think we can do some things to make them more comfortable and then let them go ahead and jump forward and do the education piece. Hey, you make very good points. What campus are you with? Arkansas. Arkansas University. Yeah. Uh, very good points. Uh, and and I, I think a very appropriate way to, to end our session here, unless there are final comments from yeah. our distinguished panel. Other than that, thank you for, uh, uh, for joining us this morning. Yeah. Okay. So John, Don, David, Steve again, double duty for Steve, uh, we thank you very much. Uh, excellent, excellent panel discussion and obviously all of you contribute to the value with your questions. You know, we talk about this word balance, we see that word balance everywhere. We talk life work balance and here we're talking tradition with innovation and trying to strike a balance. Every time I hear the word balance, I think of the classic scales, you know, and, and on the innovation side, I feel like, wow, it just keeps hitting that side. These things, every time you turn around, there's more technology, more innovation weighing down that side. And yet on the other side, I feel like we have our uh, alumni and administrators and, and faculty holding on to the bottom of the scale, kind of fighting the force that's coming on the other side rather than putting new ideas on the top to counterbalance our innovation that's taking place. So I think we need to think in a new way about how we uh, approach all this because both are important. I come from a very historic campus and tradition is part of who we are and we don't want that to ever go away. But we got to keep being cutting edge. So it's a challenge, and you guys have done a great job of helping us think about it in a clearer way. So what's next? Well, we're now on page 25 of our program. We're flying right along. We uh, open our uh, Hall of Resources is open right after this. I encourage you to all go back down. I'm sure you have not touched base at all the booths yet. I know I haven't, so I'm heading back down there. We're going to follow that. Well, we're going to have lunch included as part of that, 11.30. So if you want to eat, and I think we all want to eat, uh, you'll be down there. We have some great breakout sessions this afternoon. Again, three series of breakout sessions that are going to continue to explore a lot of these ideas, take part in those. We also, for all you folks uh, representing various regions, we have region meetings later this afternoon. Please, please participate and support your regions and, and their, their initiatives are all planning annual meetings in the fall and they need your help with that. And then of course, last but not least, we have a grand banquet tonight and uh, we'll be back down here for a big banquet and uh, more recognition and more great socializing. So take it all in. Thank you all very much. Oh, oh, one last thing. Don't for one minute think you want to miss tomorrow's general plenary session because we have three of these and tomorrow's kind of brings everything together and forces us again to look forward to where we're going from here. So uh, it's all one continuous flow. Please don't leave early. Be here tomorrow morning to support our third general plenary session. We'll see you then. Take care.